We are into our sixth week of nationwide demonstrations in Iran following the death of Masa Amini. I have the pleasure to have Miriam Amas Sadiqi here with me today to discuss these momentous events. Miriam was the co-founder of Tavana, which was certainly one of my favorite civil society NGOs on Iran. She's also the founder and director of the Cyrus Forum, which is a pro-democracy organization for Iran. And she's a senior fellow at the McDonnell Laurier Institute. I'm Ruel Mark Rex, standing in for Cliff May, and this is Foreign Policy. So Miriam, uh, why don't we start? Why don't you tell me what you think is uh, happening inside of Iran and uh, where you think uh, this is likely to go in the coming months? Well, thanks so much for having me, uh, Ruel. It's always a pleasure to talk with you about Iran. Um, it's really no exaggeration to say that this is um, a revolution. Uh, we're in the middle of it. Um, and it is the, uh, because it is a revolution, it is the most existential threat to the regime since, um, its own inception, uh, in 1979 with its revolution. Um, it is. Do you think, uh, can I just add, do you sure. think the regime now views this as such? And I yes. mean, in, two, in 2009, the Supreme Leader was just by just after the demonstrations was crunched, the pro-democracy demonstrations, which had brought out millions of folks into the streets of Tehran after it was crushed, what was that, late August of 2009, the Supreme Leader did describe those events as taking the regime to the edge of the abyss. Right. Um, do you think the regime views what's happening now as something similar to that in its danger for the theocracy? I think it's much worse than 2009 for the regime. Um, although in 2009, there were, um, according to Tehran's own mayor, millions of people on the streets, and there was much more of a sense of uh, protesters being able to occupy um, the public spaces, uh, particularly in Tehran. So it, it's very important with nonviolent um, resistance to not just come out onto the streets, but to hold the streets. And that happened with the Green Revolution, the Green Movement. Um, but why do I think it's a much more of an existential threat now? Because the entire country is in revolt and in a way that is much more uh, fundamental. So during the Green Movement, um, if Khamenei hadn't decided to give the election to Ahmadinejad, it's it's not even really, we, we, would, we may not have even seen the Green Movement happen. And ultimately, the leadership of that movement were um, Musavi and Karubi, who were regime insiders. Today, uh, people who are even still committed to the Islamist ideology, although I think there are very few left in the country, even those people see the regime as a an illegitimate, very, very corrupt, uh, repressive. Um, I mean, I, I must say, I mean, it is something to see the head of the uh, judiciary, which has been obviously the linchpin of um, Khamenei's frequent inquisitions, mm -hmm. uh, you know, publicly take issue with the way the regime is handling these demonstrations. Uh, and I just saw this morning, Rouhani was also trying to social distance himself from the way that was going on. Lahajani uh, also has uh, given uh, uh, his uh, view on this, and he's trying to find a third way. And I thought it was quite amusing when uh, Jumhuri Islami, the publication that Khamenei originally uh, ran and edited, uh, that, uh, you know, they gave 14 points uh, that the that the regime needed to do to survive. And point number 11 was do not lie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's not in their DNA. That's in, that's impossible. Yeah. Um, so uh, I thought that one was quite entertaining. So obviously, you know, 
individuals who may now be called conservative outcasts, but who were, you know, part of the regime, if not foundational figures of the regime, do seem to be deeply, deeply worried that this is, this is, as you said, an existential crisis and they don't know how to handle it. Well, I don't see how they couldn't be worried because even before this happened, that Mass Amini was killed, um, we knew that the regime was in a deep state of paranoia about its own ranks and particularly the highest up people around Khamenei, the bait. Um, and it's uh, in large part because of the infiltration by by Israel. So a lot of um, shifting of positions and and responsibilities and the constant fear that um, somebody very close to Khamenei could actually be an, an Israeli agent. So the regime was under threat um, already with that regard, already under threat because it couldn't handle the basic economics anymore. I mean, it, um, it's it's re it's it the, the the level of corruption is really uh, grotesque. I mean, this is a regime that came to power in the name of the uh, Mustazafin or the poor and downtrodden, and it's essentially created an entire nation of of poor people other than that sliver that is the mafia class, that is the regime class that that owns everything. And it, in that sense, it's no different from a Cuba or a Venezuela or a Soviet Union. And um, this is why, you know, there are a lot of people looking at what's happening um, uh, right now in Iran um, related to personal freedoms and, and the women's rights issue. And absolutely, that's fundamental. It's not just a trigger issue. It's a, it's a root cause issue. But I think uh, the economics, the, the, the severe, um, sense of, of grievance that there's no future for people who, um, actually want to work, who actually have an education, that there's no sense for them that, that, that there, there can be a future. Um, this is an, uh, you know, a driving, a force behind every single protest. And, and just because somebody is out on the streets because they're really fed up with the, the lack of personal freedoms, freedom of expression, the right to wear what they want, to act as they want, and the, to socialize, doesn't mean that they don't also see that they have no economic future. And there's a tendency among some important dissidents inside the country to want to say that this is a more um, respectable or dignified uprising than, say, those in late 2017, early 18 and, and forward, because they're not rooted in ec this. These protests, this revolution now is not rooted in economics. It's rooted in in freedom and in a pure sense. But, you know, I think like in Eastern Europe, this is all. Combined. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's sometimes it's very difficult to you know, extricate them. I mean, I would say, I mean, the poverty in Egypt is certainly as bad as the poverty in, uh, uh, in Iran, but uh, you don't see Egyptians, at least not now, uh, rising up uh, against uh, uh, President for Life, Assisi. So, uh, I mean, there is, a, I, I mean, I would argue there is, there is a a civil society political component that exists in Iran that has to do with Iranian history. It has to do with a century's efforts to sort of limit uh, central power, authoritarian power. It keeps getting waylaid. It keeps running off the rails. I mean, the, the Islamic revolution was a revolution that was, you know, in part a wage to establish a democracy. It wasn't a wage necessarily to establish a theocracy. That was another pillar of it. And the clerics won that struggle. But I mean, what interests me is, is actually the economics is a given. I mean, the regime, uh, it just doesn't handle it well. It's corrupt. It's socialist. Uh, there, I mean, I was, I found it very funny when, uh, Larijani was talking about what needed to be done. He said, uh, the government had to become, you know, sabuk. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, agile and smaller, right? You know, he, he sounded Reagan esque, actually. Right. Uh, Good luck know, with and, that. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think that's gonna, you know, do it. <laughs> right. uh, I mean, if uh, I mean, I mean, what interests me also is I actually do think the women's angle on this is crucial. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, some of this, I know some Iranian dissidents that are get a little upset that it gets that it gets 
overemphasized because women have always been on the cutting edge of dissent in Iran. Uh, I mean, Mohammad Khatami wouldn't have got elected as, as, as president in 1993 if it hadn't been for the f- female vote. Um, so, but I, I do think this time it's it's different in, in the sense that it's it's flummoxed yeah. the regime. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, how do you handle women protesting? Uh, I, I mean, do they, I mean, do they really want to shoot hundreds of women? Uh, I, I think the answer to that is is no. I mean, so I mean, do you think women are going to continue to be as preeminent and as forward leaning uh, as they have been so far? Do you think the regime has a chance of shutting that down if they engage in greater brutality? Well, um, it's hard to predict for me um, because this is a regime that has been so brutal to the Iranian people and to and and we've seen their brutality in Syria. We've seen it uh, on a global level with its terrorism. Um, so a willingness to kill is not is not the issue. It's whether in the regime's own calculations, um, it thinks that killing as it did in um, 2019, the massacre of over 1,500 people on the streets um, who were protesting, whether that will backfire. And I think that that calculation has a lot to do with how... It would would appear they believe right now it would backfire. Otherwise, I think they would have done it. Otherwise, they would have done it, right. But as as we move forward, if they don't see, if the regime doesn't see um, significant... um, credible uh, accountability, holding the the regime to account from the international community, then they'll start to, I think, recalculate and think that they can get away with it. So we really are at a very critical juncture that, um, you know, the United... What do you think the international community should do right now to make the possibility of inflating fire against young women less? The most important thing that that the United States and other democracies need to do is to not have a wait and see approach. I mean, they, 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 they there is enough evidence now, both of the regime's brutality and the um, the protesters' um, insistence on on wholesale regime change, that the United States needs to uh, announce that its um, Iran policy has changed. So the Iran policy from the Biden administration is still intent on securing a nuclear deal. Um, and every time that Rob Malley is asked about it, he doesn't say that, no, we won't pursue negotiations and we won't pursue a revival of the JCPOA. He says that, that that's not happening right now. Well, the reason it's not happening right now is because Khamenei has not been willing to accept uh, a deal despite um, an enormous number of uh, big concessions from the United States. And Khamenei, until the, the last few weeks, has thought that, well, I'll just sit back and continue to get these concessions and uh, ultimately never have to succumb to um, entering a deal. Well, he may, he may have concluded that he just doesn't want the deal. Exactly. Um, he, he, he might change that calculation if he's under a lot of uh, pressure from the protesters. But even that, I doubt. But what's important, what's important is that the United States not hold the door open for him um, and a signal to the protesters, signal to the people of Iran and really to the people of the world who are watching this to see how the leader of the free world um, reacts when this many people are um, unified. Okay, so, so play that out. Let's, let's yeah. assume that the president, because it's the president who's in charge of Iran policy, not Rob Malley. That let's assume that the president decides that you know it's not going to work. JCPOA reviving it just no longer makes sense. Yeah. The Supreme Leader doesn't want it. We've already conceded everything we can really concede. He still has said no. no. So and we're going to change policy. Uh, I mean, what do you then think the United States should do that would make a difference? in Iran? Or is there anything the United States could do in the short term that would make a difference in Iran? Well, first of all, that point itself is very important because it'll signal, uh, it'll be a big signal to the regime, it'll be a big signal to the people. But then beyond that, once that decision has been made, 
Uh, I think it will have a uh, domino effect for other democracies. Um, Europe will see that, you know, that that process, that that path to a nuclear deal is is gone. So, uh, for example, Germany has announced much more um, uh, a strong stance towards um, the regime. I think that they'll get, you know, reinforcement from that decision from the U.S. and so other European countries can, can follow. But it's also important because then it would allow the United States to pursue other things. For example, um, it's important that uh, there be a commission of inquiry from the United from the United Nations, so that the um, again the costs of repression on the ground um, increase. It's important that um, the United States realize that all of these assets um, that are frozen and and those that are not frozen can be seized and and provided to, for example, um, workers who are striking in Iran. I mean, this yeah, thing- but that I mean, I'm I'm all in favor of work worker subsidies, though. Mm-hmm. I mean, that would require. I mean, you can't even trying to do that in a way with the Hawala system, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I mean, that will take time I agree. And, and a lot of money could be lost because the regime is going to catch you many, many times when you do it. So I'm all in favor of doing it, but it's not, yeah. it's all, it's always easier said. than Absolutely. Than Absolutely. And with solidarity in Poland, it was a decade of, of creating those channels and everything. It didn't- and you had the Catholic church. And you had the Catholic Church, right? Channels right. that were incredible. You're, you're gonna, oh, some of this you're going to be doing from scratch because, I mean, one of the strengths of the opposition is that it is leaderless uh, in the sense that, you know, the regime can't kill it off. Exactly. Uh, but by being leaderless, it also makes it more difficult for people on the outside to, to some extent, to hook up with it. Uh, exactly. Like right now, so many people in the diaspora, including um, wealthy individuals, really do want to contribute. But there is no there's no pathway um, to get money into the hands of the um, the strikers. Let me play. Let me play devil's advocate. I mean, let's say mm-hmm. I mean, uh, Lahijani came very, very close to saying uh, I think he used the term evolution, cultural evolu- evolution uh, that. Let's say the regime were to abandon the hijab requirement. I mean, one of the reasons that uh, Khamenei and, and the Raisi instituted this crackdown on on female attire was because even in South Tehran, lots of women had stopped wearing the hijab. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, it was just—I mean, it was it, it, the hijab was falling of its own accord and the regime was having a great deal of difficulty trying to coerce women to putting it back on. And, and you know, even in the poorer areas of the country, um, is it conceivable in your mind that the, you know, the regime could take Mahajani's advice maybe and say, let's unofficially have a moratorium on, uh, uh, on the hijab law. So de facto, I- you yeah. can wear whatever you want. You don't have to wear the hijab anymore. Uh, do you think that? And I'm I'm skeptical. The Supreme Leader would you know accept exactly, that exactly right. But let's so, just say he did. No. Uh, well, do you think, I, I, do you think I, I, that I think, would uh, do? You think that would be the type of compromise that could save Islamic Republic or no? No, I think it's the kind of compromise. And Khamenei knows it well because he's a student of the Soviet Union, the KGB, the, the experience with uh, with Glasnost and Perestroika. He knows that any step back is going to be um, is going to um, uh, unravel um, the regime and it's going to be a huge win for the protesters. And so they'll take more Um, right now. The hijab issue, even if you ask the most uh, ardent feminists, they would not stop there um, because it's it's really just. what I mean is that in it, in and of itself, of course, it's extremely important because it's the it symbolizes the regime's uh, gender apartheid um, system. It 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 is something that hurts and humiliates women on a daily basis in a deep, deep way. Um, but it is but exactly for that reason, if it is granted, it is going to be seen as a massive victory. And they're just going to march forward and take more. So let's, I mean, let's play this out. Let's say that 
the demonstrations continue, and obviously they can be spontaneously generated by just a few women, you know, taking their hijab off at the right spot and time. So let's say these demonstrations continue, which seems reasonable, but let's say the regime doesn't mow down women um, and you don't have, at least in the Persian core, you know, what's happening in the ethnic areas is more complicated there. You know, you can kill more Baluch, you can kill more Kurds, and that might not necessarily galvanize the Iranian plateau. But let's 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 assume they, you know, they keep their bloodlust uh, uh under 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 control uh in the Persian heartland um how do you see the regime do you see the regime cracking or is this a multi-year affair I mean even if you look back at the Islamic revolution I mean that bloody thing took over a year to evolve so uh let's say they don't overreact um could is it, it how does this play out in your mind well, I mean, you know, thinking thinking as though we are the regime, patience might be the most important thing that they need to do right now is to really calibrate themselves, hold back from violence, um, not react too strongly. Um, but still, I mean, well, I think that the people speaking up from within the regime and 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 most likely they're just trying to be good cops not really uh dissenting from Khamenei in any kind of real way but still those fissures might deepen as the population just continues to become more and more powerful in the in the revolution um it for me it, it's tough to think of a way for the regime to get past this in other words that that you know i i have a hard time I mean, it seems it seems impossible but if you if you were to flip that because it seems impossible it also seems like you know this is a do or die situation so in the end it it's going to get bloody unless you know the security services particularly the revolutionary guard corps just cracks then that I mean, that's why, I mean, I look down the road that, I mean, obviously the one thing the regime wants to avoid is uh, a significant slaughter of women. Killing men is just a different category, but killing lots of women, particularly at the same time, can just, you know, exponentially increase their problems. Um, but to some extent, it's a type of thing which could create the combustion and the demonstrations of significant size that could actually crack the whole thing apart. Yes. And so I, I am I am curious about how this slow rot, which is certainly what appears to be going on, the slow boil, mm -hmm. uh, in the end takes the regime down, or are we looking at something that could go on for a very, very long time? We could be looking at something that could take a very, very long time. And also, the, if, if the regime decides to use violence in a more um, pervasive way, then it also it doesn't just risk how it looks to the outside world. And it, and it doesn't just risk how the people react to it, because so far repression has backfired um, in the sense that protesters become more. Their, their, their numbers increase and their the ferocity increases after every act of violence from the regime, but also it has the effect potentially, and I think Khamenei himself is concerned about this, that it will, will cause the already existing um, divisions and fissures to deepen and to have defections. Um, and then, then again, that'll be a big win for the people and it will galvanize them further. Um I'm not sure why the United States and Israel aren't coming together and deciding that this is the time that we really need to get serious and do everything that we can to make this happen. I think it's a it's a fear um, of what of what will be unleashed. And it's an unfortunate calculation, I think, because the status quo is much, much worse for the United States and Israel than actually really sitting down, thinking hard. What does it take? We have we have intelligence networks inside the country, inside the regime. We can well, we it, can use Israel has some. Uh, I think they have what what we call in the trade covert action networks. 
Yeah. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't know how good their intelligence networks, but they have covert action networks. I, I suspect the United States has next to zero. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's the, that's the problem, you know, working out these type of policies, adopting what, uh, you know, we all used to describe as regime change policies. Uh, uh, I mean, they take time. They take they take they take time to set up, which is why and well, they also require they require bipartisan support because they can't they can't survive in Washington without bipartisan. The, the reason I mentioned it as a, it now is that as an extension of the issue of fissures. I mean, Israel has enough intel from from how the regime on the inside is thinking and operating that it can, I think, use that intelligence. I, I sense, I could be wrong, that the United States haven't made up their mind yet that they actually want the regime to fall. Well, I mean, I think, I think Israel, I think Israel does, uh, but uh, the United States. I'd like to see it happen, but are they doing anything to make it happen? Are they doing anything to make it happen? Well, I, you know, Israel, you got to always remember, I mean, Israel's a teeny country, really mm-hmm. is. Uh, it's got a <clears throat> fairly accomplished military and it has some, obviously, some covert action potential inside of the Islamic Republic. Uh, you know, some of the operations they've engaged in, particularly when they stole the archives. Exactly. Was, was tactically very impressive. I don't know if that, <laughs> I don't know if that translates into a capacity to fundamentally affect what's taking place inside of Iran, because Iran is such a huge country. It's such a diverse country. Uh, it's a very complicated place. Uh, these things are would be extremely difficult to do if you actually had issues in the country and you could get out on the streets and see people. Uh, to do it long distance uh, adds levels of complexity uh, that uh, is, to put it politely, quite challenging. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I do wonder that um i mean suppose i mean if you had plenty potentiary control of the u.s government you know your dream sequence and you could so you could say all right i'm going to start doing something and say in the next six months if you wanted to to do something if you wanted the american government to do something what would you do now knowing because you have had some exposure to the american government Knowing its weaknesses and liabilities, uh, what would you recommend that, uh, you know, you can pick your government agency, State Department agency, et cetera, et cetera. What would you recommend that they they do at least over the next six months? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is um, and maybe is not the most important it has actually nothing to do with the, the people on the ground in Iran who are protesting. I would hit back at the uh, regime's proxies in the region harder than oriented towards slow evolutionary uh, change and civil society capacity building. We're I mean, right we, now. We even have, I mean, I have to ask you about more fundamental <laughs> questions. Do we even have a democracy pro, uh, promotion infrastructure, which is supported by the U.S. government? Really? Yes, we under, as you know, you know, George Bush, George H. Uh, I'm sorry, George W. Bush created in 2005, a pretty sizable budget. That budget continues to be big and is used um, uh, to fund projects, including Tavana, which I co-founded and co-directed. But I, you know, at the risk of sounding like I, I, know, I know more than I do, I mean, those projects are not really oriented towards um, supporting this revolution right now. And they need to be. The money needs to be, for example, uh, Voice of America, too, uh, is uh, funded through more than 20 million um, a year. But are are those uh, platforms and that taxpayer money really being used to support the revolution? I mean, again, in, in Eastern Europe, it was clear where that U.S. was going. It was going to solidarity and it was going for the express purpose of bringing down communism. But regime change has not been the 
goal of this funding for Iran. And um, and if it has been in uh, on paper, which even on paper, I haven't seen it um, in action. It's just not there. We need to re- we need to reorient that. We need to have a fresh thinking. And the U.S. government needs to not be shy about to be very overt and energetic about bringing together dissidents um, in meetings. Do you think that, uh, I mean, this is, uh, I wouldn't say it's a hobby of mine. Uh, sometimes it's more like a, a, a pain, but uh, uh, do you think there is a significant role for the Iranian expatriate community and the West, which is quite large, uh, do you think there's actually realistically a role for them here or that events are such inside of the country, communication is difficult, et cetera, et cetera. And also there's always just the difference between being in a country and being an expatriate uh, that uh, do you think they have a role to play that could be significant? And if so, how would that, how, how would that happen? Knowing as you do that you get to, 10 Iranians in a room, you have 25 difference of, uh, differences and, and, and everybody hates each other after three hours. Right. Um, I think that that has started to really change real well. I mean, we had a, a march of over 100,000 people in Berlin, over 50,000 in Toronto, a big one here in Washington. Um, there is much more of a sense of respect inside the country because they are so unified, not ideological, you know, very well. um, They're very sensitive on the ground to not letting anything get in their way that has to do with politics and ideology. They're very practical, very, very um, pragmatic. And I think that the outside in the diaspora, in the opposition groups, there is a sense of if even, you know, seven or eight weeks ago, it didn't exist. Now there's a sense of, okay, I should really not be talking about that right now, because that's going to cause more division than it's going to cause anything positive. Um, and of course, as you know, the regime has been very, very good at stoking division and, um, and, and creating all kinds of distrust. That has really started to started to change. I think one person that's been very, well, several people have been very important. Um, I think. Um, uh, the former crown prince Reza Pahlavi is very important in just sticking with the principles of democracy and human rights. Hamid Ismailoun, who is the leader of the families of uh, those who died on the um, Ukraine Airlines flight, uh, PS752, shot down by the IRGC. He's been incredible in terms of bringing together and organizing. Masi Ali Nejad. I mean, this is not a... Um, this is not a community that is lacking leadership in the diaspora. And uh, I think that those people that I mentioned are starting to uh, work better uh, with other people. I mean, do you think it would be beneficial, for example, if uh, you actually had conferences or a conference, a big one, uh, get together of, uh, of Iranians and try to draw up a post-Islamist idea of what Iran should be? Or do you think, no, that would be more, more, mostly hot air, be counterproductive, too many disagreements would surface? Uh, I mean, that's always the, the trick is if you can, when you bring people together, can you bring them together productively? Uh, and uh do you, do you think that that now is a possibility and would it be helpful or no, it's not, I wouldn't put it on the front burner. I think if it's done well, I think if it's done with a real sense of um, strategy, it's a very good idea. Um, Cyrus Forum, which I created, is really focused on creating capacity for the day after overthrow. And of course, Things that we are already doing and we'll be doing more of is bringing people together in ways, though, that are focused on a particular thing that needs to be done. Transitional justice, um, rebuilding the economy, um, protecting the uh, saving the environment. Um, So by focusing on the future after the the regime, one of the big um, 
uh, side effects or secondary um, impacts is that the people who exist right now will will come together and work in a very uh, concrete way together, um, despite their political differences. Um, so we're starting to do that. I think the advantage is that we're doing it in a way that is we'll focus on this, sh- this issue and then we'll focus on this issue and then we'll focus on this issue and we'll eventually bring it all together. Um, but I think a conference that is at the sort of the general uh, level where you bring basically all the major opposition forces together with international stakeholders um, and with a sense of what a provisional government or a transitional government will look like, I think is very, very important. And uh, would you would you say that should be done in Europe or the United States if you pull that off? I would say a place where it's easy for people to travel and probably that's a European country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's an interesting idea. I go back and forth on it in my own mind of, of uh, whether you could, whether if you could pull it off and two, uh, uh, whether it'd be productive. It, it could be very productive because it could do something that I think is highly valuable, and that is to shame uh, the Americans and the Europeans. Uh, and you should never underestimate shame. It it, ha- it, d- it does have an effect. Uh, in, um, you know, because you know, fundamentally, I think you probably agree there is no difference with this regime uh, than there was with the regime uh, that they were negotiating with in 2011, 2012 to launch the JPOA, which then became, uh, you know, the, J- the JPA or whatever, and then the J- J- JPOA uh, that. JCPOA, that uh, mm-hmm. there, there is fundamentally no difference. The regime is the regime. Some personalities change. Uh, Rouhani wanted to have a, you know, a Chinese model imported into the Islamic Republic to make the, to make the Islamic Republic stronger. But essentially, we're talking about, you know, people who have more in common than they do, uh, than they do differences. Uh, yet, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't really talk about, effectively talk about human rights issues the uh least uh, uh on the democratic side uh you you didn't get a lot of traction uh arms control always trumped issues of human rights in fact some folks even went to so far as to say you know arms control is a human right um so but now you know when you see people on the streets the way you have it becomes actually harder to do that Exactly. It, uh, and it, certainly if they start, you know, when they start killing people, it becomes, I think, even maybe even a little embarrassing to do it. Um, so anyway, I, I, I do think that there is some benefit in, in sort of cornering uh, the Westerners. So they, uh, you know, they, they have to at least move in the right direction. I don't know if you're uh, going to get the Americans to ever adopt a regime stra- change strategy. Those days may be gone. Mm-hmm. But at least you could stop them from doing, you know, more counterproductive things or, uh, that there are. Stop them from doing the negatives if you can't get them to do the, do the positive. Right. Right. I mean, I think that we might be getting there in terms of making it very embarrassing for uh, Mali and the administration to say that the talks are you know, are are anything but not over. I think that the administration is just waiting to wait and see approach. You know, they they feel like they have nothing to lose by just continuing to have occasional meetings with dissidents to make it look like they are um, doing something on that front and making the occasional uh, human rights tweet, but then keeping the door open for Hamani. So anytime he wants the nuclear deal, he can get it and the regime would get billions of dollars. And I mean, I hate to say this, but the way that they packaged it in the past, um, uh, pallets of cash when, uh, you know, in, in exchange for, uh, hostages and saying that the, the two things have nothing to do with each other. I, mean, I remember, you know, friends of mine who, um, are democratic leaning leftists and that they, they bought it hook and sinker, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, I think back then, uh, to right. some extent, not now. That's true. But, but back then, uh, many of them really did believe in what what Obama clearly believed and when he came into office. And yep. that is uh, that their administration could be transformative. Uh, and that's pretty hard to argue now. 
that, yeah. uh, especially new- since Obama himself said he was wrong. <laughs> right. Right. So, I mean, there the I think the transformative argument, which was a pretty powerful argument for a lot of folks, uh, whether they, you know, I don't know, I, I don't I can't look into their hearts and determine how sincerely they believed it, but they certainly advocated it and they yeah. wanted to believe it was true. Right. Uh, I, I think that's gone out the window. Right. Uh, it's a it's a much more crass calculation now. Yeah. And uh, people are starting to see how all these regimes are really in it together. Russia, uh, Iran and China. And there's a, more of a general uh, understanding, I think, on the Amer- American population that these are bad guys and they're in it together. Uh, um, the fact that, uh, you know, the regime is supplying um, Russian drones to Russia drones to use against Ukrainians is I watched Zelensky last night talk about that at an award ceremony, USIP. He and Masiali Najad were awarded. Uh, the 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 fact that there's such close collaboration and learning and support for each other among these regimes is something that I think is starting to really be understood and appreciated more by the ordinary average American. Yeah, no, I think that's true. I mean, I I mean, I have, I, I've always been of the opinion that. Uh, you know, Iran, the Islamic Republic, uh, has has remained a fairly unpopular subject uh, in the United, United States. So uh, you don't you don't have to really work hard. It's actually not a popular issue. I would say it's more of an elite issue, and it's also uh, mm-hmm. just the problem of the Middle East exactly. that uh, Americans have grown allergic to the Middle East. Yep. Uh, now, I, I do think Iran could be transformative if, in fact, you could pull off a counter-revolution and it could go democratic. Yeah, I mean, those are, I, those, it those is those remarkable. question marks, but it would be, I think, the, the effect on the region and the effect on the United States would be significant. I agree. And that's why I was really kind of, I've been really surprised by how much of an outpouring of support there is from celebrities and authors like J.K. Rowling or... Um, just so many different uh, musicians, so many different kinds of people who are coming out and not just like once or twice, but consistently expressing support for these protesters. You know, I got so used to people not caring about Iran, basically. And it is, it's a big change. And it, it, it is because of the woman's issue. It is because this, this is was, was a young girl, so innocent, coming to the capital city from Kurdistan with her family. And it's just the idea that the that it could happen to anybody. Um, and then, of course, they see how much people are risking. I mean, I guess we haven't seen uh, Ukraine is the other example, of course. But it's like uh, it's people in the United States and Western democracies in general have become so complacent and cynical and apathetic, isolationist. And then all of a sudden here are these two countries where the people are willing to give up everything, give their lives for freedom. And it's just a huge wake up call to people. And I think they want to take the wake up call. Yeah, no, and I, it just makes it more difficult. I mean, we know the people in Washington, D.C., who not that long ago were quite prepared to say that uh, a lot of Iranians were comfortable living under a theocracy. Uh, and it turns out, no, that the Iranian experience of that is not dissimilar to the Western experience of that. And uh, the more of it you get, the less you like it. And uh, I mean, that's essentially what, you know, a gathering of luminaries in Qom, uh, the holy city in Iran, just said uh, that, uh, you know, the actions by this regime are tarnishing and weakening the faith. Um, and there is no faith in Iran anymore. Well, that's it. I mean, it's entirely possible. <clears throat> you, you really have to, you, you know, sort of the the twilight, the Guten Damerung of, of, of theocracy, of, mili- of Islamic militancy. Uh, I don't know, I would go so far as to say Islamic identity, I question that, but certainly everything the Islamic Republic has stood for is now in danger of, 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 of collapse. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, from the inside, it's already collapsed. I mean, the mosques are empty. There's no real sense of religiosity. There's no 
uh, it's not it's not just a lack of it's a real hatred of among the population for um, these people, for the mullahs, the 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 ideology and even the people who uh, I may have mentioned this in the beginning, even the people who believe in Islamist ideology don't believe in this regime. You know, so I think that there was an. Well, then you also have the growth of, you know, once again, you have the growth of Shiite mysticism and, uh, you know, sort of peasant Shiism, which, of course, by definition is anti clerical. So, you know, yeah, I mean, the. Uh, and now, the, 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 I mean, to, to, uh, we'll sort of close it up here, but I mean, I, I would say up until recently, maybe even now, I mean, one of the strengths of the regime is that it actually does reflect on its own weaknesses. I mean, if you. And I'm, I'm curious, and, and I think that, you know, people like Rouhani and Laurijani and others are actually reflecting on all these weaknesses now, but they can't figure out, you know, how to get they out. They won't be able to. They're structurally incapable. It's a totalitarian regime. They, they, it cannot fix itself. As soon as it s- starts to try, it will fall apart. Yeah, no, I, I, I tend to agree with that. That's why I, I would say that uh, I'm more optimistic about this than I have been a long time. I don't know what I want to put a timeline on it, but um, uh, it's very hard for me to see them getting out of this pickle so long as young women are willing to put themselves on the front line. Uh, I think they've got, uh, I think they've got more than they can handle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't want to time it either, but it's also the kind of thing where, Within a matter of days, we could be in a completely different place because if uh, all sectors or major sectors of the economy decide to strike altogether and everyone everyone who's participated in at least one protest so far decides that they're all going to come out on one day, that's a huge, huge mobilization. No, no. If that were to happen, I mean, I think in this sense, it's like that old saying about bankruptcy, you know, it, yeah. it comes on gradually then happens all of a sudden. Right. Uh, and it's it's it is now where in 2019, 2017, uh, even in 2009, I didn't find it conceivable uh, or likely. Now, mm-hmm. I, now I do believe it is conceivable. And I would certainly agree with you in the way you began this discussion that what we're watching this time around is a revolution. Yeah, this was a, this was a good discussion. Thank and, you so much. Uh, and I look forward to uh, to more. I appreciate it very much. Thank you for listening to Foreign Policy. If you found the program worthwhile, we suggest you subscribe to Foreign Policy on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you prefer to listen to your podcasts. Send us your feedback, your questions, your ideas to Foreign Policy at fdd.org. For more information about this episode and others and about our distinguished guests, visit us online at fdd.org. Until next time, I'm Cliff May, and you've been listening to Foreign Policy.